Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode number 18, titled Advice on Mahamudra Meditation. I think it's very important to know uh, because otherwise this kind of Mahamudra thing, Dzogchen thing, or Shamatha ahead of Vipassana sort of thing, which are sort of Shamatha's ahead of Vipassana, there is a tendency to, because it seems easier at first, it seems like, oh, okay, I'm, it's all empty, you know, it's all space. It's sort of marketed that way, actually, by teachers, that some teachers, that, you know, what is all these complications? You just, like, you, like, uh, float in space, and that will cure your problems. And that is actually a deceptive. It's not, not really true. It won't help that much. It might help your blood pressure, and it might give you, a, it's a palliative type of thing. But it, it, it's sterile in a certain way, because it can't really change anything. The, the, um, now I, I went to bring another book, which I forgot, but it doesn't matter. I can do it by memory. Dongkhapa has a marvelous passage in his uh, Essence of True Eloquence, the thing of you. Did any of you go to the Beacon Theater last fall? Did you go to it? There's a really remarkable passage in that text, which was in there, but by that time it was toward the last day. It was much too short a time to try to do all that. But it was really auspicious anyway. Anyway, there's this amazing passage that says that the, that the human being has three perceptual habits, or three kinds of perception. I mean, there are many ways, of course, of saying that, but... Uh, that, but, but in this particular case, there's particular three ones, which is very, very interesting. He says, that is, perceiving something as if it intrinsically exists. And that's the habitual ignorant perception of things, as if they exist essentially, or with intrinsic substance, or, or intrinsic reality, or objectivity, or identifiability. There are different levels of refinement of that notion of intrinsic existence. So there's perceiving things as if they intrinsically exist. And then there's perceiving things as if they intrinsically do not exist, as intrinsically non-existent, as you know, essentially, ultimately non-existent. And that's sort of like the disappearing state when you have been looking for the, the intrinsic reality of something and then the whole thing disappeared. And then you feel, oh, it really didn't exist at all. And then the third thing is perceiving thing without qualifying it as either intrinsically existent or intrinsically non-existent. That's the third one. And then it says, the person who, it doesn't say enlightened person, but it says the person who has achieved a realistic worldview, you know, the first branch of the Eightfold Path, right? You all know the Eightfold Path. Come on, you really you do know that, right? You know the all eight thing. The first branch is uh, people say right worldview. I hate that because right and wrong. Right means that it seems seems to be conforming to a certain rule or dogma. So that's why I don't like right. Or maybe just because I'm always wrong. I don't know why I don't. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas <laughs> if you translate samyak in Sanskrit, samyak or yandakpa in Tibetan as realistic or re- real, realist. So a realistic worldview is so much better. You know, it's a worldview that, is, that corresponds with reality, of what it's a view of, you know, that's, that's so much more real. I, I have to say, Alan Wallace, I first heard that in the work of Alan Wallace's, and I have to thank him for that. I have to give him attribution. Usually translators are so jealous of each other, they never give attribution to each other. So I have to set a good example. So realistic and unrealistic is much better, and it fits with what Buddhism really is, which is realism. It's a sustained exercise in realism. 
Okay, so it says the person who has not yet achieved the realistic worldview of these three perceptual habits only has the first and the last. That is the, per the habitual perception of things as intrinsically existent and the perception of things without qualifying as to existence or non-existence. Like, for example, peripheral, one of the examples people give is peripheral vision. If I'm looking at you and I peripherally see the painting here on the wall, I'm not really looking at it, so my mind doesn't ascribe to it intrinsic existence. It just sort of notices it without getting into a judgment or a sort of ascription of its quality of existence. That's one example of that. Okay? Then it says, the person who has the realistic worldview, has achieved the realistic worldview, has all three of these habit patterns. The perception of intrinsic existence, the perception of intrinsic non-existence, and the perception without qualifying. And then it ha he, have, he gives three things that I don't, may not remember exactly. And if you, if you understand that, it says, then you will reject the argument that before achieving insight into emptiness or selflessness, cultivation of the spirit of enlightenment of the mind of renunciation, of love and compassion or the mind of renunciation is more useless and worthless because it's just more, more intrinsic reality perception. So they're useless. And you will not agree with that. And you will not agree with the idea that after some kind of enlightenment, then all activity is spontaneous and there's no thought. It's all just like impulsive. And that will be wrong. And then there's a third one, which I can't remember. I have it in the other room, but I forgot to walk in with it. That's old age. But never mind, I'll find it for you later. Now, I had one Lama who brilliantly, brilliantly used to put things in a way that you could understand. The Taratoku. I think Joe also knew him in his previous life. He's still reincarnated in a younger person who I don't know well, but his former life. And he said this. He said that our intrinsic reality habit of seeing everything as a kind of essential absolute, having its own absolute nature of being what it is, so that like it's, it's you know, that plastic cup you just put down, it's cuphood. It sort of just jumps off it and it's sort of intrinsic in it. So what that is, is that's our intrinsic reality investment in the thing has been so wrapped around our perception of the cup, sort of as if forever, from, although it's also, it was learned at some time in life and actually from the Buddhist sense brought from instincts of formal life, but it's been wrapped around our relational perception of that cup as just a cup without transcribing to it any kind of quality of existence or non-existence. It's been wrapped around so long that when we don't find the cup as being like that by investigating its causality process, investigating its part and whole, its composition process, you know, investigating its designation process, you know, its labeling, its naming process, and so on. Uh, when we don't find it, it then, then that intrinsic reality perception of it, intrinsically real perception of it, takes the relative perception of it out with it. So when the distorted or exaggerated perception of it as intrinsically real disappears, it also takes the relative perception of it with it, and everything seems to have disappeared. Do you follow me? Because they've been so entwined together for so long. So what we think is it's wow, bursting into reality, which is just vast space, is nothing but the perception of the intrinsic non-existence of that thing we were looking for. Do you follow me? which actually is it's equally, in itself, is still delusory. Because it's like now we think it's really not a clear existent. You follow? We don't just think, well, we couldn't find it as really existent. But we think, no, it's really not existent. You follow me? So we've added that middle of the three perceptual habits, we've added the middle one. Do you follow? And, but if we have experienced experience that, we have, achieved, we have achieved something which is called the realistic worldview. Because when we deeply achieve that, even though it's still a distorted experience at first, 
we, be, we have the basis of developing the non-dual intuition of the non-duality in a way of the of the of its existence and non-existence so actually it comes to exist in a way that the exaggerated existence and the exaggerated non-existence cancel each other out and we begin to just relate to it in a way in the third way really of not qualified but, but we do qualify but we qualify both ways at once so the two cancel each other out if you follow me so it's, it's non-duality by persevering in a balanced duality it's a marvelous thing it's like not a double bind it's a quadruple bind it's a kind of quadruple bind, which enlightenment awareness is something more like that. Our tendency to, is to associate enlightenment with deep sleep, actually. Our escapist tendency. Because as differentiated human beings, and the big differentiation between, between self and the universe, which is other than the self, is so strenuous, actually. That's why we can only stay awake 12, 14 hours a day, and then we collapse. It's like, we're like that Atlas statue down at Rockefeller Center there on Fifth Avenue. You know, like, uh, holding up this world that is not us. Holding it off, holding it up, whatever, you know. We're trying to keep our position and the reason a little bit in it. It's so, so strenuous. Constantly refreshing, you know, like... You know, a television screen, you know, the, the, the Sony three-color gun that goes, you know, which is why when you film a television thing, it looks all weird, you know, but it looks stable when we look at it. Because the photons are being shot by this gun, it's being constantly refreshed, like that. So our, our brain is constantly refreshing our perceptions of things based on our concepts of them, so that the things seem to be perceived in a way organized according to what concepts we have about them. Right? So we feel we're in our familiar world. So we feel safe in our familiar world. So, so, uh, so this is a very, very important thing. And to understand this conceptually and inferentially is really important when you do Mahamudra meditation. That's why I'm dwelling on it. When you go at it, or when you go at when you meditate in general, and when you go especially at the thing where before doing a lot of like Nagarjuna's 27 critique chapters of the wisdom book of Nagarjuna's and things like that, before you sort of embody and learn a way of being critically analytic of everything <clears throat> by doing analytic meditation, which is not vipassana of just being mindful while you count your breath, but it's going into the nature of everything and it all kind of dissolving under analysis around you. And, uh, but before you do that, it's very, very important to have this kind of, this, the phenomenology of the potential experiences you can have a little bit under your belt, where you have the, especially having what they call the royal reason of relativity, that anything you, you since you are an, a, a relative being, a relational being, and there is no non-relational component of yourself or your mind or anything. There's a concept in your mind of non-relationality, but that's itself a relational thing. And when you know that, then you have any kind of experience that seems like you ran into the absolute. Your mind will automatically know, well, I'm experiencing this, it's not absolute. It's relational, because experiencing means relating to it. Even it seems to, if it seems to be having an experience of something that seems non-relative. I always think of 2001, 2010, you probably all saw that film, I hope. And remember they, they ran into this big black stone that hummed there? And everybody freaked out, and the stone actually created seven new suns or something, I don't know what. And that's a perfect idea of a concept of an absolute thing that does relative things. It's the same psychotic concept of God, you know, attributed as a, theologically as a, and therefore irrationally as, a, as an absolute being that creates relative things without relating to them. 
and matters to relative things without being related to them. Which, of course, is just making the terms relative and absolute contradictory and meaningless. If you follow me. So if Moses had the royal reason of relativity, that was stated. And some Bush, n- not a member of the Bush crime family, but <laughs> the earlier Bush, <laughs> burning and talking and telling him to go do crazy things like try to confront the Pharaoh, he would have said, you say you're absolute, but you're talking to me. So if you were absolute, I, I wouldn't see you. So you must be relative. So you're just a bigger guy than me, because you can burn like a bush. So you go deal with Pharaoh. You will stay here in the desert with my flock and my family. <laughs> Would have been a little different history. But human beings want to find absolutes because, you know, unenlightened human beings. But this is Buddha's psychology, you know, Buddha's psychotherapy, because human beings feel that inside themselves is some kind of absolute self. That's the source of our whole power. So that therefore the difference between ourselves and others is an absolute difference. And therefore others all have absolute selves and objects have absolute selves. And this makes it unmanageable, our relationship with them. Problematic and unmanageable. It's actually really fairly simple. Okay, so now let's look at this. As usual, you know, in these kind of practices that are supposed to be so simple, like Dzogchen and Mahamudra and Great Seal, there is, it's really simple. You just like focus your mind on both subject and object on on emptiness. (laughs) But, which is the Great Seal, because it shapes everything, it envelops everything in emptiness. So you're enveloping your form in emptiness. But then they get into the preliminaries. (laughs) After saying it's all simple, and then they're all very complicated. So you, but you know a lot of this stuff, right? Namo Maha Mudraya. Now, Mudra, of course, the word Mudra means a seal. It can also mean a gesture, Mudra. But here it means a seal. And um, it also means in uh, Tantra, and there's a Tantra Mahamudra and a Sutra Mahamudra. This is more dealing with Sutra one. That is to say, exo and esoteric. And the difference between exo and esoteric is, uh, simply in this kind of simple context, is that the exoteric, the sort of duality of the practitioner and the goal that the practitioner is seeking is preserved in the practice. So it's called the causal vehicle. So what you're doing is seeking some understanding or realization with the allowing and in leaving intact the presumption that you're, you don't already have it. But, you're going, but it's there and it's possible to achieve and you're going to get it. So that gives you a motivation to go down the path. So that's the cause. It's causal vehicle. The, the other one, the exoter- esoteric, is what's called a goal vehicle or a fruitional vehicle in the sense that you're not thinking that just by adopting that vehicle you're already there, but you are creating a dissonance in your mind that although it's a path that you're on, the path involves imagining that you're at the goal. So that you then are dealing with the dissonance that you're dealing with is not there's something wrong with where I am and I have to get somewhere in the way of like, I, am, I know where I am, which is not at my goal. But you're even throwing that concept of I know where I am into question. And you're saying, well, Buddha thinks I'm at the goal. I don't feel like I am. But since the Buddha is enlightened, or all the enlightened beings are enlightened, teachers are enlightened, Buddha is enlightened, whatever, you know, Dara is enlightened, and this, if they think I am, then I must be, even though I don't feel like I am. So I'm simulating being at the goal, and I'm dealing with my feeling, critically with my feeling of not being at the goal, in a way where I've placed myself under greater dissonant stress or tension to, to you know, to eliminate the veils and the blocks 
of my feeling and experiencing that goal. You follow me? That's called a fruition, or I like to use the word goal vehicle. So it's a, there's means, or you could say means end. You, know? you, you use the means of, to get to a goal, or you use the end as the means to get to the goal. Like that. That's the difference between the two. And the reason that the esoteric therefore is esoteric is that the person who practices the esoteric version is allowing themselves to feel, uh, to imagine or simulate a sense of the kind of confidence of a being who is enlightened. And, that's, and it's esoteric because if you, if you take a, our own unenlightened semi-psychotic state and we then say, well, now I'm enlightened, then, then I'll be an enlightened psycho. <laughs> I will be stuck in the feeling that I'm enlightened. And then I'll really be out of touch with reality, more than I was before. So one has to have understood, to some strong degree, the real prerequisite for entering into Tantra and esoteric practices is having really a firm, inferential, based, rational conviction of the royal reason of relativity, so that, which is the balm or the medicine or the immunization against absolutizing anything that could possibly happen to you. Even if you, I mean, you see, it's hard to imagine, maybe, but although you all have meditated, you're all like people seeking to know your minds, so some of you may have had experiences like in deep meditation where like you suddenly were in a vast realm of pure golden space. And you felt divine and godlike. And you felt, or you had a vision of something like God. You know, people have these experiences. And so then you get a conviction that, that if you don't have the royal reason of relativity, you feel, oh, that was the absolute. And then I'm looking for that, you know, type of thing. So the, medita- the altered states you can achieve through meditation are extremely cosmic states. So it's very important to have this understanding that if it's a state that I didn't have before, there's a boundary between it and where I was before. And it doesn't somehow simultaneously incorporate everywhere I've been, then it's only a relational state. If I experience it, it's relational. In other words. Really strong conviction on that. Because if there's nothing absolute about me that could somehow just be absolute, sort of thing. Although in a way, you know, you have to, <laughs> when we get to this kind of area, you have to be careful about any kind of formulation of whatsoever, because in a way, that mirror experience, based on the, the strange double binding of the double bind of the relative and the absolute, of the existent and the non-existent, uh, is sort of like somehow intuitively without being able to grasp it as an experience that you have realizing you always had it or something like that and then even finding it always had been with you so it was nothing, it's not new and realizing that you're made of it almost so that you don't need to know it, I can't explain it again, I can't, no one can explain it it's, it's inexplainable <laughs> You know, the famous Vimala Kirti Sutra. Did you read the Vimala Kirti Sutra in this class? Not, not yet? Oh, are you, I hope you read it. Not only because I translated it better than other people, but... <laughs> and I can improve it. That's not, mine is not perfect. I, I'm going to make a new one, a new edition. But soon or someday. And, and, uh, but, uh, you know, there's this famous thing where Vimala Kirti is asked about the nature of non-duality and he doesn't say anything. After 32 people have said things, which were all good, but, but then he doesn't say anything, and then that's better, that's best. Because, but he, while not saying anything, he is, he's in a state where he feels that everyone else is already there. So that's why it's good. There, there could be a silence where he was not saying anything because he was thinking they couldn't understand it. That wouldn't have been good. That's, a, that's, a, that's an exclusionary silence. But a silence where he doesn't need to say anything because... He's perceiving them all at the place where they always knew, had, know it themselves. Even though they don't know that they know it, then that's a good sign. Okay. 
So Nama Mahamudraya hailed the great seal. And this is not the seal on the Central Park Zoo. Also, oh yeah, I was going to say the seal is also in Tantra. That's why I got off on Tantra. The seal in Tantra is a consort. And that's why sometimes you can translate the great seal as the great embrace. Because the metaphor for the seal, for the great seal, is union with the universe as a consort. So it's like a kind of communion with the entire universe as if the, the unity, the dualistic non-dual unity of self and universe was like complete bliss, like the bliss of sexual union, of the ideal sexual union. So their seal can also mean that, mudra. With gratitude I honor my peerless mentor, paragon of master who nakedly revealed ineffable mind's diamond realm inseparable from the great seal, pervasive nature of all. Okay, so that's easy. And uh, he's talking about Sanjay Yishi. This is, this is the great uh, pension lama who wasn't a pension lama originally. He was a uh, Lausanne Chuti Gyaltsen. He was the reincarnation of one of Tsongkhapa's major disciples. But he created the Dalai Lama Institution. Um, he, he elevated the fifth Dalai Lama. He, he was the one who managed the elevation of the fifth Dalai Lama to be the, to be the responsible for the country, for Tibet, you know, in the 16th, 17th century. A marvelous person. I write this to introduce the great seal lineage of Master Dharma Vajra. Dharma Vajra was a yogi kind of mystic uh, disciple of... Um, I think it's, that's a grand, a grand disciple of Tsongkhapa. Uh, Chuti Dorje his name, was a Tibetan name. Uh, the Gandan Kadyu tradition of instruction, quintessence of all teachings, public and private. My comment, comments cover three aspects of practice preliminary points, actual practice, and concluding points. Okay, but that's pretty straightforward. But you know that what, all the stuff that I said before about emptiness and those three, those three types of experiences and how they balance each other, how you mustn't take a disappearing experience or space like echo points experience as, as being the discovery of the ultimate. It's just the opposite of the habitual investment of intrinsic reality in differentiated things in a seeming state of non-differentiation. But that, that state is differentiated from a state of differentiation, so it still is differentiated. So therefore, it's not, it's not emptiness. But it's a good stepping stone to emptiness in that it balances the distorted, exaggerated perception of differentiated objects as being non-empty. But it is also empty, in other words. That's just a key point. <laughs> 